squat grey building of only 34 storeys. Over the main entrance the words, Central London Hatchery and Conditioning Centre, and, in a shield, the world state's motto, Community, Identity, Stability. The enormous room on the ground floor faced towards the north. Cold for all the summer beyond, beyond the panes, for all the tropical heat of the room itself, a harsh thin light, light glared through the windows, hungrily seeking some draped lay figure, some pallid shape of academic goose flesh, but finding only the glass and nickel and bleakly shining porcelain of a laboratory. Wintriness responded to wintriness. The overalls of the workers were white, their hands gloved with a pale corpse-colored rubber. The light was frozen, dead, a ghost. Only from the yellow barrels of the microscopes did it borrow a certain rich and living substance, lying along the polished tubes like butter, streak after luscious streak in long recession down the work tables. And this, said the director opening the door, is the fertilizing room. Bent over their instruments, three hundred fertilizers were plunged, as the director of hatcheries and conditioning entered the room, in the scarcely breathing silence, the absent-minded, soliloquizing hum or whistle, of absorbed concentration. A troop of newly arrived students, very young, pink and callow, followed nervously, rather abjectly, at the director's heels. Each of them carried a notebook, in which, whenever the great man spoke, he desperately scribbled. Straight from the underscore horse's mouth. It was a rare privilege. The DHC for Central London always made a point of personally conducting his new students round the various departments. Just to give you a general idea, he would explain to them. For of course some sort of general idea they must have, if they were to do their work intelligently though as little of one, if they were to be good and happy members of society, as possible. For particulars, as everyone knows, make for virtue and happiness, generalities are intellectually necessary evils. Not philosophers but fret sawyers and stamp collectors compose the backbone of society. Tomorrow, he would add, smiling at them with a slightly menacing geniality, you'll be settling down to serious work. You won't have time for generalities. Meanwhile. Meanwhile, it was a privilege. Straight from the horse's mouth into the notebook. The boy scribbled like mad. Tall and rather thin but upright, the director advanced into the room. He had a long chin and big rather prominent teeth, just covered, when he was not talking, by his full, floridly curved lips. Old, young? Thirty? Fifty? Fifty-five? It was hard to say. And anyhow the question didn't arise, in this year of stability, AF 632, it didn't occur to you to ask it. T.I. shall begin at the beginning, said the DHC and the more zealous students recorded his intention in their notebooks, begin at the beginning. These, he waved his hand, are the incubators. And opening an insulated door he showed them racks upon racks of numbered test tubes. The week's supply of ova. Kept, he explained, at blood heat, whereas the male gametes, and here he opened another door, they have to be kept at 35 instead of 37. Full blood heat sterilizes. Rams wrapped in their amagin beget no lambs. Still leaning against the incubators he gave them, while the pencils scurried illegibly across the pages, a brief description of the modern fertilizing process, spoke first, of course, of its surgical introduction the operation undergone voluntarily for the good of society, not to mention the fact that it carries a bonus amounting to six months' salary, continued with some account of the technique for preserving the excised ovary alive and actively developing, passed on to a consideration of optimum temperature, salinity, viscosity, referred to the liquor in which the detached and ripened eggs were kept, and, leading his charges to the work tables, Akshu. Ally showed them how this liquor was drawn off from the test tubes, how it was let out drop by drop onto the specially warmed slides of the microscopes, how the eggs which it contained were inspected for abnormalities, counted and transferred to a porous receptacle, how, and he now took them to watch the operation, this receptacle was immersed in a warm bouillon containing free-swimming spermatozoa at a minimum concentration of 100,000 per cubic centimeter, he insisted, and how, after 10 minutes, the container was lifted out of the liquor and its contents re-examined, how, if any of the eggs remained unfertilized, it was again immersed, and, if necessary, yet again, how the fertilized ova went back to the incubators, where the alphas and betas remained until definitely bottled, while the gammas, deltas and epsilons were brought out again, after only 36 hours, to undergo Bakanovsky's process. Bakanovsky's process, repeated the director, and they. Students underlined the words in their little notebooks. One egg, one embryo, one adult normality. But a Bakanovskyfied egg will bud, will proliferate, will divide. From 8 to 96 buds, and every bud will grow into a perfectly formed embryo, and every embryo into a full-sized adult. Making 96 human beings grow where only one grew before. Progress. Essentially, the DHC concluded, Bakanovskification consists of a series of arrests of development. We check the normal growth and, paradoxically enough, the egg responds by budding. 
Response by budding. The pencils were busy. He pointed. On a very slowly moving band a rack full of test tubes was entering a large metal box, another rack full was emerging. Machinery faintly purred. It took eight minutes for the tubes to go through, he told them. Eight minutes of hard x-rays being about as much as an egg can stand. A few died, of the rest, the least susceptible divided into two, most put out four buds, some eight, all were returned to the incubators, where the buds began to develop, then, after two days, were suddenly chilled, chilled, and checked. Two, four, eight, the buds in their turn budded, and having budded were dosed. Almost to death with alcohol, consequently burgeoned again and having budded bud out of bud out of bud were thereafter further arrest being generally fatal left to develop in peace. By which time the original egg was in a fair way to becoming anything from 8 to 96 embryos a prodigious improvement, you will agree, on nature. Identical twins but not in piddling twos and threes as in the old viviparous days, when an egg would sometimes accidentally divide, actually by dozens, by scores at a time. Scores, the director repeated and flung out his arms, as though he were distributing largest. Scores. But one of the students was fool enough to ask where the advantage lay. My good boy. The director wheeled sharply round on him. Can't you see? Can't you see? He raised a hand, his expression was solemn. Bakunovsky's process is one of the major instruments of social stability. Major instruments of social stability. Standard men and women, in uniform badges. The whole of a small factory staffed with the products of a single Bakunovskified egg. 96 identical twins working 96 identical machines. The voice was almost tremulous with enthusiasm. You really know where you are. For the first time in history. He quoted the planetary motto. Community, identity, stability. Grand words. If we could Bakunovskify indefinitely the whole problem would be solved, solved by standard gammas, unvarying deltas, uniform epsilons. Millions of identical twins. The principle of mass production at last applied to biology. But, alas, the director shook his head, we can't Bakunovskify indefinitely. 96 seemed to be the limit, 72 a good average. From the same ovary and with gametes of the same mai to manufacture as many batches of identical twins as possible that was the best, sadly a second best, that they could do. And even that was difficult. For in nature it takes 30 years for 200 eggs to reach maturity. But our business is to stabilize the population at this moment, here and now. Dribbling out twins over a quarter of a century what would be the use of that? Obviously, no use at all. But Podsnap's technique had immensely accelerated the process of ripening. They could make sure of at least 150 mature eggs within two years. Fertilize and Bakunovskify in other words, multiply by 72 and you get an average of nearly 11,000 brothers and sisters in 150 batches of identical twins, all within two years of the same age. And in exceptional cases we can make one over yield us over 15,000 adult individuals. Beckoning to a fair-haired, ruddy young man who happened to be passing at the moment. Mr. Foster, he called. The ruddy young man approached. Can you tell us the record for a single ovary? Mr. Foster. 16,012 in this center, Mr. Foster replied without hesitation. He spoke very quickly, had a vivacious blue eye, and took an evident pleasure in quoting figures. 16,012, in 189 batches of identicals. But of course they've done much better, he rattled on, in some of the tropical centers. Singapore has often produced over 16,500, and Mombasa has actually touched the 17,000 mark. But then they have unfair advantages. You should see the way a negro ovary responds to pituitary. It's quite astonishing, when you're used to working with European material. Still, he added, with a laugh, but the light of combat was in his eyes and the lift of his chin was challenging, still, we mean to beat them if we can. I'm working on a wonderful delta minus ovary at this moment. Only just 18 months old. Over 12,700 children already, either decanted or in embryo. And still going strong. We'll beat them yet. That's the spirit I like, cried the director and clapped Mr. Foster on the shoulder. Come along with us, and give these boys the benefit of your expert knowledge. M.F. Foster smiled modestly. With pleasure. They went. In the bottling room all was harmonious bustle and ordered activity. Flaps of fresh sous peritoneum ready cut to the proper size came shooting up in little lifts from the organ store in the sub-basement. Whiz and then, click. The lift hatches flew open, the bottle liner had only to reach out a hand, take the flap, insert, smooth down, and before the lined bottle had had time to travel out of reach along the endless band, whiz, click. Another flap of peritoneum had shot up from the depths, ready to be slipped into yet another bottle, the next of that slow interminable procession on the band. Next to the liners stood the matriculators. The procession advanced, one by one the eggs were transferred from their test tubes to the larger containers, deftly the peritoneal lining was.
slit, the morula dropped into place, the saline solution poured in, and already the bottle had passed, and it was the turn of the labellars. Heredity, date of fertilization, membership of Bakanovsky group details were transferred from test tube to bottle. No longer anonymous, but named, identified, the procession marched slowly on, on through an opening in the wall, slowly on into the social predestination room. Right eight cubic meters of cart index, said Mr. Underscore Foster with relish, as they entered. Containing all the relevant information, added the director. Brought up to date every morning. And coordinated every afternoon. On the basis of which they make their calculations. So many individuals, of such and such quality, said Mr. Foster. Distributed in such and such quantities. The optimum decanting rate at any given moment. Unforeseen wastages promptly made good. Promptly, repeated Mr. Foster. If you knew the amount of overtime I had to put in after the last Japanese earthquake. He laughed good-humouredly and shook his head. The predestinators send in their figures to the fertilizers. Who give them the embryos they ask for. And the bottles come in here to be predestined in detail. After which they are sent down to the embryo store. Where we now proceed ourselves. And opening a door Mr. Foster led the way down a staircase into the basement. The temperature was still tropical. They descended into a thickening twilight. Two doors and a passage with a double turn ensured the cellar against any possible infiltration of the day. Embryos are like photograph film, said Mr. Foster waggishly, as he pushed open the second door. They can only stand red light. And in effect the sultry darkness into which the students now followed him was visible and crimson, like the darkness of closed eyes on a summer's afternoon. The bulging flanks of row on receding row and tier above tier of bottles glinted with innumerable rubies, and among the rubies moved the dim red specters of men and women with purple eyes and all the symptoms of lupus. The hum and rattle of machinery faintly stirred the air. Give them a few figures, Mr. Foster, said the director, who was tired of talking. Mr. Foster was only too happy to give them a few figures. 220 meters long, 200 wide, 10 high. He pointed upwards. Like chickens drinking. The students lifted their eyes towards the distant ceiling. Three tiers of racks, ground floor level, first gallery, second gallery. The spidery steel work of gallery above gallery faded away in all directions into the dark. Near them three red ghosts were busily unloading demijohns from a moving staircase. The escalator from the social predestination room. Each bottle could be placed on one of fifteen racks, each. Rack, though you couldn't see it, was a conveyor traveling at the rate of thirty-three and a third centimeters an hour. 267 days at 8 meters a day. 2,136 meters in all. One circuit of the cellar at ground level, one on the first gallery, half on the second, and on the 267th morning, daylight in the decanting room. Independent existence so called. But in the interval, Mr. Foster concluded, we've man underscore aged to DOA law to them. Oh, a very great deal. His laugh was knowing and triumphant. That's the spirit I like, said the director once more. Let's walk around. You tell them everything, Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster duly told them. Told them of the growing embryo on its bed of peritoneum. Made them taste the rich blood surrogate on which it fed. Explained why it had to be stimulated with placentin and thyroxine. Told them of the corpus luteum extract. Showed them the jets through which at every twelfth meter from 0 to 2040 it was automatically injected. Spoke of those gradually increasing doses of pituitary administered during the final 96 meters of their course. Described the artificial maternal circulation installed in every bottle at meter 112, showed them the reservoir of blood surrogate, the centrifugal pump that kept the liquid moving over the placenta and drove it through the synthetic lung and waste product filter. Referred to the embryo's troublesome tendency to anemia, to the massive doses of hog stomach extract and fetal foals liver with which, in consequence, it had to be supplied. Showed them the simple mechanism by means of which, during the last two meters out of every eight, all the embryos were simultaneously shaken into familiarity with movement. Hinted at the gravity of the so-called trauma of decanting, and enumerated the precautions taken to minimize, by a suitable training of the bottled embryo, that dangerous shock. Told them of the test for sex carried out in the neighborhood of meter 200. Explained the system of labeling AT for the males, a circle for the females and for those who were destined to become free martins a question mark, black on a white ground. For of course, said Mr. Foster, in the vast majority of cases, fertility is merely a nuisance. One fertile ovary in 1200 that would really be quite sufficient for our purposes. But we want to have a good choice. And of course one must always have an enormous margin of safety. So we allow as many as 30% of the female embryos to develop normally. The others get a dose of male sex hormone every 24 meters for the rest of the course. Result, they're decanted as free martin structurally quite normal, except, he had to admit, that they do have the slightest tendency to grow beards, but sterile. Guaranteed sterile. Which brings us at last, 
continued Mr. Foster, out of the realm of mere slavish imitation of nature into the much more interesting world of human invention. He rubbed his hands. For of course, they didn't content themselves with merely hatching out embryos, any cow could do that. We also predestine and condition. We decant our babies as socialized human beings, as alphas, or epsilons, as future sewage workers or future, he was going to say future world controllers, but correcting himself, said future dir. Ectors of hatcheries, instead. The DHC acknowledged the compliment with a smile. They were passing meter 320 on rack 11. A young beta minus mechanic was busy with screwdriver and spanner on the blood surrogate pump of a passing bottle. The hum of the electric motor deepened by fractions of a tone as he turned the nuts. Down, down. A final twist, a glance at the revolution counter, and he was done. He moved two paces down the line and began the same process on the next pump. Reducing the number of revolutions per minute, Mr. Underscore Foster explained. The surrogate goes round slower, therefore passes through the lung at longer intervals, therefore gives the embryo less oxygen. Nothing like oxygen shortage for keeping an embryo below PAR. Again he rubbed his hands. But why do you want to keep the embryo below PAR? asked an ingenuous student. Ass, said the director, breaking a long silence. Hasn't it occurred to you that an epsilon embryo must have an epsilon environment as well as an epsilon heredity? It evidently hadn't occurred to him. He was covered with confusion. The lower the cast, said Mr. Foster, the shorter the oxygen. The first organ affected was the brain. After that the skeleton. At 70% of normal oxygen you got dwarfs. At less than 70 eyeless monsters. Who are no use at all, concluded Mr. Foster. Whereas, his voice became confidential and eager, if they could discover a technique for shortening the period of maturation what a triumph, what a benefaction to society. Consider the horse. They considered it. Mature at 6, the elephant at 10. While at 13 a man is not yet sexually mature, and is only full-grown at 20. Hence, of course, that fruit of delayed development, the human intelligence. But in epsilons, said Mr. Foster very justly, we don't need human intelligence. Didn't need and didn't get it. But though the epsilon mind was mature at 10, the epsilon body was not fit to work till 18. Long years of superfluous and wasted immaturity. If the physical development could be speeded up till it was as quick, say, as a cow's, what an enormous saving to the community. Enormous, murmured the students. Mr. Foster's enthusiasm was infectious. He became rather technical, spoke of the abnormal endocrine CO ordination which made men grow so slowly, postulated a germinal mutation to account for it. Could the effects of this germinal mutation be undone? Could the individual epsilon embryo be made a revert, by a suitable technique, to the normality of dogs and cows? That was the problem. And it was all but solved. Pilkington, at Mombasa had produced individuals who were sexually mature at four and full-grown at six and a half. A scientific triumph. But socially useless. Six-year-old men and women were too stupid to do even epsilon work. And the process was an all-or-nothing one, either you failed to modify it all, or else you modified the whole way. They were still trying to find the ideal compromise between adults of twenty and adults of six. So far without success. Mr. Foster sighed and shook his head. Their wanderings through the crimson twilight had brought them to the neighborhood of meter 170 on rack 9. From this point onwards rack 9 was enclosed and the bottles performed the remainder of their journey in a kind of tunnel, interrupted here and there by openings two or three meters wide. Heat conditioning, said Mr. Foster. Hot tunnels alternated with cool tunnels coolness was wedded to discomfort in the form of hard X-rays. By the time they were decanted the embryos had a horror of cold. They were predestined to emigrate to the tropics, to be miners and acetate silk spinners and steel workers. Later on their minds would be made to endorse the judgment of their bodies. We condition them to thrive on heat, concluded Mr. Foster. Our colleagues upstairs will teach them to love it. And that, put in the director sententiously, that is the secret of happiness and virtue liking what you've got to do. All conditioning aims at that, making people like their unscapable social destiny. In a gap between two tunnels, a nurse was delicately probing with a long fine syringe into the gelatinous contents of a passing bottle. The students and their guides stood watching her for a few moments in silence. Well. Lenina, said Mr. Foster, when at last she withdrew the syringe and straightened herself up. The girl turned with a start. One could see that, for all the lupus and the purple eyes, she was uncommonly pretty. Henry. Her smile flashed redly at him a row of coral teeth. Charming, charming, murmured the director and, giving her two or three little pats, received in exchange a rather deferential smile for himself. What are you giving them? asked Mr. Foster, making his tone very professional. Oh the usual typhoid and sleeping sickness. Tropical workers start being inoculated at meter 150, Mr. Foster explained to the students. The embryos still have gills. 
we immunize the fish against the future man's diseases. Then, turning back to Lenina, 10 to 5 on the roof this afternoon, he said, as usual. Charming, said the director once more, and, with a final pat, moved away after the others. On rack 10 rows of next generation's chemical workers were being trained in the toleration of lead, caustic soda, tar, chlorine. The first of a batch of 250 embryonic rocket plane engineers was just passing the 1100 meter mark on rack 3. A special mechanism kept their containers in constant rotation. To improve their sense of balance, Mr. Foster explained. Doing repairs on the outside of a rocket in midair is a ticklish job. We slacken off the circulation when they're right way up, so that they're half starved, and double the flow of surrogate when they're upside down. They learn to associate topsy turvydom with well being, in fact, they're only truly happy when they're standing on their heads. And now, Mr. Foster went on, I'd like to show you some very interesting conditioning for Alpha Plus intellectuals. We have a big batch of them on Rack 5. First gallery level, he called to two boys who had started to go down to the ground floor. They're round about meter 900, he explained. You can't really do any useful intellectual conditioning till the fetuses have lost their tails. Follow me. But the director had looked at his watch. 10 to 3, he said. No time for the intellectual embryos, I'm afraid. We must go up to the nurseries before the children have finished their afternoon sleep. Mr. Foster was disappointed. At least one glance at the decanting room, he pleaded. Very well then. The director smiled indulgently. Just one glance. S.N. Mr. Foster was left in the decanting room. The DHC and his students stepped into the nearest lift and were carried up to the fifth floor. Infant nurseries. Neo-Pavlovian conditioning rooms, announced the notice board. The director opened a door. They were in a large bare room very bright and sunny, for the whole of the southern wall was a single window. Half a dozen nurses, trousered and jacketed in the regulation white viscose linen uniform, their hair aseptically hidden under white caps, were engaged in setting out bowls of roses in a long row across the floor. Big bowls, packed tight with blossom. Thousands of petals, ripe blown, and silkily smooth, like the cheeks of innumerable little cherubs, but of cherubs, in that bright light, not exclusively pink and Aryan, but also luminously Chinese, also Mexican, also apoplectic with too much blowing of celestial trumpets, also pale as death, pale with the posthumous whiteness of marble. The nurses stiffened to attention as the DHC came in. Set out the books, he said curtly. In silence the nurses obeyed his command. Between the rose bowls the books were duly set out a row of nursery quartos opened invitingly each at some gaily colored image of beast or fish or bird. Now bring in the children. They hurried out of the room and returned in a minute or two, each pushing a kind of tall dumbwaiter laden on all its four wire-netted shelves, with eight-month-old babies, all exactly alike, a Bakanovsky group, it was evident, and all, since their cast was Delta, dressed in khaki. Put them down on the floor. The infants were unloaded. Now turn them so that they can see the flowers and books. Turned, the babies at once fell silent, then began to crawl towards those clusters of sleek colors, those shapes so gay and brilliant on the white pages. As they approached, the sun came out of a momentary eclipse behind a cloud. The roses flamed up as though with a sudden passion from within, a new and profound significance seemed to suffuse the shining pages of the books. From the ranks of the crawling babies came little squeals of excitement, gurgles and twitterings of pleasure. The director rubbed his hands. Excellent, he said. It might almost have been done on purpose. The swiftest crawlers were already at their goal. Small hands reached out uncertainly, touched, grasped, unpetaling the transfigured roses, crumpling the illuminated pages of the books. The director waited until all were happily busy. Then, watch carefully, he said. And, lifting his hand, he gave the signal. The head nurse, who was standing by a switchboard at the other end of the room, pressed down a little lever. There was a violent explosion. Shriller and ever shriller, a siren shrieked. Alarm bells maddeningly sounded. The children started, screamed, their faces were distorted with terror. And now, the director shouted, for the noise was deafening. Now we proceed to rub in the lesson with a mild electric shock. He waved his hand again, and the head nurse pressed a second lever. The screaming of the babies suddenly changed its tone. There was something desperate, almost insane, about the sharp spasmodic yelps to which they now gave utterance. Their little bodies twitched and stiffened, their limbs moved jerkily as if to the tug of unseen wires. We can electrify that whole strip of floor, bawled the director in explanation. But that's enough, he signaled to the nurse. The explosion ceased. The bell stopped ringing, the shriek of the siren died down from tone to tone into silence. The stiffly twitching bodies relaxed, and what had become the sob and yelp of infant maniacs broadened out once more into a normal how. Of ordinary terror. Offer them the flowers and the books again. The nurses obeyed, but at the approach of the roses, 
at the mere sight of those gaily colored images of pussy and cock a doodle doo and baa baa black sheep, the infants shrank away in horror, the volume of their howling suddenly increased. Observe, said the director triumphantly, observe. Books and loud noises, flowers and electric shocks. Already in the infant mind these couples were compromisingly linked, and after two hundred repetitions of the same or a similar lesson would be wedded indissolubly. What man has joined, nature is powerless to put asunder. They'll grow up with what the psychologists used to call an instinctive hatred of books and flowers. Reflexes unalterably conditioned. They'll be safe from books and botany all their lives. The director turned to his nurses. Take them away again. Still yelling, the cocky babies were loaded onto their dumb waiters and wheeled out, leaving behind them the smell of sour milk and a most welcome silence. One of the students held up his hand, and though he could see quite well why you couldn't have lower caste people wasting the community's time over books, and that there was always the risk of their reading something which might undesirably decondition one of their reflexes, yet. Well, he couldn't understand about the flowers. Why go to the trouble of making it psychologically impossible for deltas to like flowers? Patiently the DHC explained. If the children were made to scream at the sight of a rose, that was on grounds of high economic policy. Not so very long ago, a century or thereabouts, gammas, deltas, even epsilons, had been conditioned to like flowers flowers in particular and wild nature in general. The idea was to make them want to be going out into the country at every available opportunity, and so compel them to consume transport. And didn't they consume transport, asked the student. Quite a lot, the DHC replied. But nothing else. Primroses and landscapes, he pointed out, have one grave. Defect, they are gratuitous. A love of nature keeps no factories busy. It was decided to abolish the love of nature, at any rate among the lower classes, to abolish the love of nature, but not the tendency to consume transport. For of course it was essential that they should keep on going to the country, even though they hated it. The problem was to find an economically sounder reason for consuming transport than a mere affection for primroses and landscapes. It was duly found. We condition the masses to hate the country, concluded the director. But simultaneously we condition them to love all country sports. At the same time, we see to it that all country sports shall entail the use of elaborate apparatus. So that they consume manufactured articles as well as transport. Hence those electric shocks. I see, said the student, and was silent, lost in admiration. There was a silence, then, clearing his throat, once upon a time, the director began, while our Ford was still on earth, there was a little boy called Ruben Rubinovich. Ruben was the child of Polish-speaking parents. The director interrupted himself. You know what Polish is, I suppose. A dead language. Like French and German, added another student, officiously showing off his learning. And parent, questioned the DHC. There was an uneasy silence. Several of the boys blushed. They had not yet learned to draw the significant but often very fine distinction between smut and pure science. One, at last, had the courage to raise a hand. Human beings used to be, he hesitated, the blood. Rushed to his cheeks. Well they used to be viviparous, quite right. The director nodded approvingly. And when the babies were decanted 99 born, came the correction. Well, then they were the parents I mean, not the babies, of course the other ones. The poor boy was overwhelmed with confusion. In brief, the director summed up, the parents were the father and the mother. The smut that was really science fell with a crash into the boy's eye avoiding silence. Mother, he repeated loudly rubbing in the science, and, leaning back in his chair, these, he said gravely, are unpleasant facts, I know it. But then most historical facts of a unpleasant. He returned to little Reuben to little Reuben, in whose room, one evening, by an oversight, his father and mother, crash, crash, happened to leave the radio turned on. For you must remember that in those days of gross viviparous reproduction, children were always brought up by their parents and not in state conditioning centers. While the child was asleep, a broadcast program from London suddenly started to come through, and the next morning, to the astonishment of his crash and crash, the more daring of the boys ventured to grin at one another, little Reuben woke up repeating word for word a long lecture by that curious old writer, one of the very few whose works have been permitted to come down to us, George Bernard Shaw, who was speaking according to a well-authenticated tradition, about his own genius. To little Reuben's wink and snigger, this lecture was, of course, perfectly incomprehensible and, imagining that their child had suddenly gone mad, they sent for a doctor. He, fortunately, understood English, recognized the discourse as that which Shaw had broadcasted the previous evening, realized the significance of what had happened, and sent a letter to the medical press about it. The principle of sleep teaching, or hypnopedia, had been discovered. The DHC made an impressive pause. The principle had been discovered, but many, many years were to elapse before that principle was usefully applied. 
the case of Little Reuben occurred only 23 years after our Ford's first T model was put on the market. Here the director made a sign of the T on his stomach and all the students reverently followed suit. And yet, furiously the students scribbled. Hypnopedia, first used officially in AF 214. Why not before? Two reasons. A. These early experimenters, the DHC was saying, were on the wrong track. They thought that hypnopedia could be made an instrument of intellectual education. A small boy asleep on his right side, the right arm stuck out, the right hand hanging limp over the edge of the bed. Through a round grating in the side of a box a voice speaks softly. The Nile is the longest river in Africa and the second in length of all the rivers of the globe. Although falling short of the length of the Mississippi-Missouri, the Nile is at the head of all rivers as regards the length of its basin, which extends through 35 degrees of latitude. At breakfast the next morning, Tommy, someone says, do you know which is the longest river in Africa? A shaking of the head. But don't you remember something that begins, the Nile is the, the Nile is the longest river in Africa and the second in length of all the rivers of the globe. The words come rushing out. Although falling short of, well now, which is the longest river in Africa? The eyes are blank. I don't know. But the Nile, Tommy. The Nile is the longest river in Africa and second. Then which river is the longest, Tommy? Tommy burst into tears. I don't know, he howls. That howl, the director made it plain, discouraged the earliest investigators. The experiments were abandoned. No further attempt was made to teach children the length of the Nile in their sleep. Quite rightly. You can't learn a science unless you know what it's all about. Whereas, if they'd only started on moral education, said the director, leading the way towards the door. The students followed him, desperately scribbling as they walked in all the way up in the lift. Moral education, which ought never, in any circumstances, to be rational. Silence, silence, whispered a loud speaker as they stepped out at the 14th floor, and silence, silence, the trumpet mouths indefatigably repeated at intervals down every corridor. The students and even the director himself rose automatically to the tips of their toes. They were alphas, of course, but even alphas have been well conditioned. Silence, silence. All the air of the 14th floor was sibilant with the categorical imperative. Fifty yards of tiptoeing brought them to a door which the director cautiously opened. They stepped over the threshold into the twilight of a shuttered dormitory. 80. Cots stood in a row against the wall. There was a sound of light regular breathing and a continuous murmur, as of very faint voices remotely whispering. A nurse rose as they entered and came to attention before the director. What's the lesson this afternoon? he asked. We had elementary sex for the first 40 minutes, she answered. But now it's switched over to elementary class consciousness. The director walked slowly down the long line of cots. Rosy and relaxed with sleep, 80 little boys and girls lay softly breathing. There was a whisper under every pillow. The DHC halted and, bending over one of the little beds, listened attentively. Elementary class consciousness, did you say? Let's have it repeated a little louder by the trumpet. At the end of the room a loud speaker projected from the wall. The director walked up to it and pressed a switch. All wear green, said a soft but very distinct voice, beginning in the middle of a sentence, and Delta children wear khaki. Oh no, I don't want to play with Delta children. And Epsilons are still worse. They're too stupid to be able to read or write. Besides they wear black, which is such a beastly color. I'm so glad I'm a beta. There was a pause, then the voice began again. Alpha children wear gray. They work much harder than we do, because they're so frightfully clever. I'm really awfully glad I'm a beta, because I don't work so hard. And then we are much better than the gammas and deltas. Gammas are stupid. They all wear green, and delta children wear khaki. Oh no, I don't want to play with delta children. And epsilons are still worse. They're too stupid to be able. The director pushed back the switch. The voice was silent. Only its thin ghost continued to mutter from beneath the 80 pillows. They'll have that repeated 40 or 50 times more before they wake, then again on Thursday, and again on Saturday. A hundred and twenty times three times a week for thirty months. After which they go on to a more advanced lesson. Roses and electric shocks, the khaki of deltas and a whiff of asafetida wetted indissolubly before the child can speak. But wordless conditioning is crude and wholesale, cannot bring home the finer distinctions, cannot inculcate the more complex courses of behavior. For that there must be words, but words without reason. In brief, hypnopedia. The greatest moralizing and socializing force of all time. The students took it down in their little books. Straight from the horse's mouth. Once more the director touched the switch. So frightfully clever, the soft, insinuating, indefatigable voice was saying, I'm really awfully glad I'm a beta, because, not so much like drops of water, though water, it is true, can wear holes in the hardest granite, rather, drops of liquid sealing wax, 
drops that adhere, encrust, incorporate them. Selves with what they fall on, till finally the rock is all one scarlet blob. Till at last the child's mind is these suggestions, and they. Brave New World at 29 Some of the suggestions cs the child's mind. And not the child's mind only. The adult's mind too all his life long. The mind that judges and desires and decides made up of these suggestions. But all these suggestions are our suggestions. The director almost shouted in his triumph. Suggestions from the state. He banged the nearest table. It therefore follows. A noise made him turn round. Oh, Ford, he said in another tone, I've gone and woken the children. Outside, in the garden, it was playtime. Naked in the warm June sunshine, six or seven hundred little boys and girls were running with shrill yells over the lawns, or playing ball games, or squatting silently in twos and threes among the flowering shrubs. The roses were in bloom, two nightingales soliloquized in the boscage, a cuckoo was just going out of tune among the lime trees. The air was drowsy with the murmur of bees and helicopters. The director and his students stood for a short time watching a game of centrifugal bumble puppy. Twenty children were grouped in a circle round a chrome steel tower. A ball thrown up so as to land on the platform at the top of the tower rolled down into the interior, fell on a rapidly revolving disc, was hurled through one or other of the numerous apertures pierced in the cylindrical casing, and had to be caught. Strange, mused the director, as they turned away. Strange to think that even in our Ford's day most games were played without more apparatus than a ball or two and a few sticks and perhaps a bit of netting. Imagine the folly of allowing people to play elaborate games which do nothing whatever to increase consumption. It's madness. Nowadays the controllers won't approve of any new game unless it can be shown that it requires at least as much apparatus as the dot most complicated of existing games. He interrupted himself. That's a charming little group, he said, pointing. In a little grassy bay between tall clumps of Mediterranean heather, two children, a little boy of about seven and a little girl who might have been a year older, were playing, very gravely and with all the focused attention of scientists' intent. On a labor of discovery, a rudimentary sexual game. Charming, charming, the DHC repeated sentimentally. Charming, the boys politely agreed. But their smile was rather patronizing. They had put aside similar childish amusements too recently to be able to watch them now without a touch of contempt. Charming? But it was just a pair of kids fooling about, that was all. Just kids. I always think, the director was continuing in the same rather maudlin tone, when he was interrupted by a loud boohooing. From a neighboring shrubbery emerged a nurse, leading by the hand a small boy, who howled as he went. An anxious-looking little girl trotted at her heels. What's the matter? asked the director. The nurse shrugged her shoulders. Nothing much, she answered. It's just that this little boy seems rather reluctant to join in the ordinary erotic play. I'd noticed it once or twice before. And now again today. He started yelling just now honestly, put in the anxious-looking little girl, I didn't mean to hurt him or anything. Honestly. Of course you didn't, dear, said the nurse reassuringly. And so, she went on, turning back to the director, I'm taking him in to see the assistant superintendent of psychology. Just to see if anything's at all abnormal. Quite right, said the director. Take him in. You stay here, little girl, he added, as the nurse moved away with her still howling charge. What's your name? Polly Trotsky. An Avery good name too, said the director. Run away now and see if you can find some other little boy to play with. The child scampered off into the bushes and was lost to sight. Exquisite little creature, said the director, looking after her. Then, turning to his students, what I'm going to tell you now, he said, may sound incredible. But then, when you're not accustomed to history, most facts about the past do sound incredible. He let out the amazing truth. For a very long period before the time of our Ford, and even for some generations afterwards, erotic play between children had been regarded as abnormal, there was a roar of laughter, and not only abnormal, actually immoral, no, and had therefore been rigorously suppressed. A look of astonished incredulity appeared on the faces of his listeners. Poor little kids not allowed to amuse themselves? They could not believe it. Even adolescents, the DHC was saying, even adolescents like yourselves not possible. Barring a little surreptitious autoerotism and homosexuality absolutely nothing nothing. In most cases, till they were over twenty years old. Twenty years old, echoed the students in a chorus of loud disbelief. Twenty, the director repeated. I told you that you'd find it incredible. But what happened, they asked. What were the results? The results were terrible. A deep resonant voice broke startlingly into the dialogue. They looked around. On the fringe of the little group stood a stranger a man of middle height, black-haired, with a hooked nose, full red lips, eyes very piercing and dark. Terrible, he repeated. 
The DHC had at that moment sat down on one of the steel and rubber benches conveniently scattered through the gardens, but at the sight of the stranger, he sprang to his feet and darted forward, his hand outstretched, smiling with all his teeth, effusive. Controller. What an unexpected pleasure. Boys, what are you thinking of? This is the controller, this is his Ford ship, Mustafa Mond. In the 4,000 rooms of the center the 4,000 electric clocks simultaneously struck four. Discarnate voices called from the trumpet mouths. Main day shift off duty. Second day shift take over. Main day shift off, in the lift, on their way up to the changing rooms, Henry Foster and the assistant director of predestination rather pointedly turned their backs on Bernard Marx from the psychology bureau, averted themselves from that unsavory reputation. The faint hum and rattle of machinery still stirred the crimson air in the embryo store. Shifts might come and go, one lupus-colored face give place to another, majestically and forever the conveyors crept forward with their load of future men and women. Lenina Crown walked briskly towards the door. His fortship Mustafa Mond. The eyes of the saluting students almost popped out of their heads. Mustafa Mond. The resident controller for Western Europe. One of the ten world controllers. One of the ten and he sat down on the bench with the DHC, he was going to stay, to stay, yes, and actually talk to them. Straight from the horse's mouth. Straight from the mouth of Ford himself. Two shrimp-brown children emerged from a neighboring shrubbery, stared at them for a moment with large, astonished eyes, then returned to their amusements among the leaves. You all remember, said the controller, in his strong deep voice, you all remember, I suppose, that beautiful and inspired saying of our Fords, history is bunk. History, he repeated slowly, is bunk. He waved his hand, and it was as though, with an invisible feather whisk, he had brushed away a little dust, and the dust was Harappa, was Ur of the Chaldees, some spider webs, and they were Thebes and Babylon and Knossos and Mycenae. Whisk. Whisk and where was Odysseus, where was Job? where were Jupiter and Gotama and Jesus. Whisk and those specks of antique dirt called Athens and Rome, Jerusalem and the Middle Kingdom all were gone. Whisk the place where Italy had been was empty. Whisk, the cathedrals, whisk, whisk, King Lear and the thoughts of Pascal. Whisk, passion, whisk, requiem, whisk, symphony, whisk. Going to the Phillies this evening, Henry, inquired the assistant predestinator. I hear the new one at the Alhambra is first rate. There's a love scene on a bearskin rug. They say it's marvelous. Every hair of the bear reproduced. The most amazing tactual effects. That's why you're taught no history, the controller was saying. But now the time has come. The DHC looked at him nervously. There were those strange rumors of old forbidden books hidden in a safe in the controller's study. Bibles, poetry Ford knew what. Mustafa Mond intercepted his anxious glance and the corners of his red lips twitched ironically. It's all right, director, he said in a tone of faint derision, I won't corrupt them. The DHC was overwhelmed with confusion. Those who feel themselves despised do well to look despising. The smile on Bernard Marx's face was contemptuous. Every hair on the bear indeed. T shall make a point of going, said Henry Foster. ZB Mustafa Mond leaned forward, shook a finger at them. Just try to realize it, he said, and his voice sent a strange thrill quivering along their diaphragms. Try to realize what it was like to have a viviparous mother. That smutty word again. But none of them dreamed this time, of smiling. Try to imagine what living with one's family meant. They tried, but obviously without the smallest success. And do you know what a home was? They shook their heads. From her dim crimson cellar Lenina Crown shot up seventeen stories, turned to the right as she stepped out of the lift, walked down a long corridor and, opening the door marked girls' dressing room, plunged into a deafening chaos of arms and bosoms and underclothing. Torrents of hot water were splashing into or gurgling out of a hundred baths. Rumbling and hissing, 80 vibrovacuum massage machines were simultaneously kneading and sucking the firm and sunburnt flesh of 80 superb female specimens. Everyone was talking at the top of her voice. A synthetic music machine was warbling out a super cornet solo. Hello, Fanny, said Lenina to the young woman who had the pegs and locker next to hers. Fanny worked in the bottling room, and her surname was also Crown. But as the 2,000 million inhabitants of the planet had only 10,000 names between them, the coincidence was not particularly surprising. Lenina pulled at her zippers downwards on the jacket. Downwards with a double-handed gesture at the two that held trousers, downwards again to loosen her undergarment. Still wearing her shoes and stockings, she walked off towards the bathrooms. Home, home a few small rooms, stiflingly over-inhabited by a man, by a periodically teeming woman, by a rabble of boys and girls of all ages. No air, no space, an under-sterilized prison, darkness, disease, and smells. The controller's evocation was so vivid that one of the boys, more sensitive than the rest, turned pale at the mere description and was on the point of being sick. Lenina got out of the bath, toweled herself dry, 
took hold of a long flexible tube plugged into the wall, presented the nozzle to her breast, as though she meant to commit suicide, pressed down the trigger. A blast of warmed air dusted her with the finest talcum powder. Eight different scents and Odie Colony were laid on in little taps over the wash basin. She turned on the third from the left, dabbed herself with sheeper end, carrying her shoes and stockings in her hand, went out to see if one of the vibrovacuum machines were free. And home was as squalid psychically as physically. Psychically, it was a rabbit hole, a midden, hot with the frictions of tightly packed life, reeking with emotion. What suffocating intimacies, what dangerous, insane, obscene relationships between the members of the family group. Maniacally, the mother brooded over her children, ER children. Brooded over them like a cat over its kittens, but a cat that could talk, a cat. That could say, my baby, my baby, over and over again. My baby, and oh, oh, at my breast, the little hands, the hunger, and that unspeakable agonizing pleasure. Till at last my baby sleeps, my baby sleeps with a bubble of white milk at the corner of his mouth. My little baby sleeps yes, said Mustafa Mond, nodding his head, you may well shudder. Underscore who are you going out with tonight? Lenina asked, returning from the vibrovac like a pearl illuminated from within, pinkly glowing. Nobody. Lenina raised her eyebrows in astonishment. I've been feeling rather out of sorts lately, Fanny explained. Dr. Wells advised me to have a pregnancy substitute. But, my dear, you're only 19. The first pregnancy substitute isn't compulsory till 21. I know, dear. But some people are better if they begin earlier. Dr. Wells told me that brunettes with wide pelvises, like me, ought to have their first pregnancy substitute at 17. So I'm really two years late, not two years early. She opened the door of her locker and pointed to the row of boxes and labeled files on the upper shelf. Syrup of corpus luteum, Lenina read the names aloud. Overin, guaranteed fresh, not to be used after August ist, AF 632. Mammary gland extract, to be taken three times daily, before meals, with a little water. Placentin, 5 cubic centimeters to be injected intravenally every third day. Ugh. Lenina shuddered. How I loathe INTR avenels, don't you? Yes. But when they do one good Fanny was a particularly sensible girl. R. Ford or R. Freud, as, for some inscrutable reason, he chose to call himself whenever he spoke of psychological matters R. Freud had been the first to reveal the appalling dangers of family life. The world was full of fathers was therefore full of misery, full of mothers therefore of every kind of perversion from sadism to chastity, full of brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts full of madness and suicide. And yet, among the savages of Samoa, in certain islands off the coast of New Guinea, the tropical sunshine lay like warm honey on the naked bodies of children tumbling promiscuously among the hibiscus blossoms. Home was in any one of twenty palm-thatched houses. In the Trobriand's conception was the work of ancestral ghosts, nobody had ever heard of a father. Extremes, said the controller, meet. For the good reason that they were made to meet. Dr. Wells says that a three months pregnancy substitute now will make all the difference to my health for the next three or four years. Well, I hope he's right, said Lenina. But, Fanny, do you really mean to say that for the next three months you're not supposed to, oh no, dear. Only for a week or two, that's all. I shall spend the evening at the club playing musical bridge. I suppose you're going out. Lenina nodded. Who with? Henry Foster. Again. Fanny's kind. Rather moon-like face took on an incongruous expression of pained and disapproving astonishment. Do you mean to tell me you're east slash going out with Henry Foster? Mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters. But there were also husbands, wives, lovers. There were also monogamy and romance. Though you probably don't know what those are, said Mustafa Mond. They shook their heads. Family, monogamy, romance. Everywhere exclusiveness, a narrow channeling of impulse and energy. But everyone belongs to everyone else he concluded, citing the hypnopedic proverb. The students nodded, emphatically agreeing with a statement which upwards of 62,000 repetitions in the dark had made them accept, not merely as true, but as axiomatic, self-evident, utterly indisputable. But after all, Lenina was protesting, it's only about four months now since I've been having Henry. Only four months. I like that. And what's more, Fanny went on, pointing an accusing finger, there's been nobody else except Henry all that time. Has there? Lenina blushed scarlet, but her eyes, the tone of her voice remained defiant. No, there hasn't been anyone else, she answered almost truculently. And I jolly well don't see why there should have been. Oh, she jolly well doesn't see why there should have been, Fanny repeated, as though to an invisible listener behind Lenina's left shoulder. Then, with a sudden change of tone, but seriously, she said, I really do think you ought to be careful. It's such horribly bad form to go on and on like this with one man. 
At 40, or 35, it wouldn't be so bad. But at your age, Lenina. No, it really won't do. And you know how strongly the DHC objects to anything intense or long drawn. Four months of Henry Foster, without having another man why, he'd be furious if he knew. Think of water under pressure in a pipe. They thought of it. I pierce it once, said the controller. What a jet. He pierced it twenty times. There were twenty piddling little fountains. My baby. My baby. Mother. The madness is infectious. My love, my one and only, precious, precious. Mother, monogamy, romance. High spurts the fountain, fierce and foamy the wild jet. The urge has but a single outlet. My love, my baby. No wonder these poor pre-moderns were mad and wicked and miserable. Their world didn't allow them to take things easily, didn't allow them to be sane, virtuous, happy. What with mothers and lovers, what with the prohibitions they were not conditioned to obey, what with the temptations and the lonely remorses, what with all the diseases and the endless isolating pain, what with the uncertainties and the poverty they were forced to feel strongly. And feeling strongly, and strongly, what was more, in solitude, in hopelessly individual isolation, how could they be stable? Of course there's no need to give him up. Have somebody else from time to time, that's all. He has other girls, doesn't he? Lenina admitted it. Of course he does. Trust Henry Foster to be the perfect gentleman always correct. And then there's the director to think of. You know what a stickler. Nodding, he patted me on the behind this afternoon, underscore said Lenina. There, you see. Fanny was triumphant. That shows what he stands for. The strictest conventionality. Stability said the controller, stability. No civilization without social stability. No social stability without individual stability. His voice was a trumpet. Listening they felt larger, warmer. The machine turns, turns, and must keep on turning forever. It is death if it stands still. A thousand millions scrabbled the crust of the earth. The wheels began to turn. In a hundred and fifty years there were two thousand millions. Stop all the wheels. In a hundred and fifty weeks there are once more only a thousand millions. A thousand 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 men and women have starved to death. Wheels must turn steadily, but cannot turn untended. There must be men to tend them, men as steady as the wheels upon their axles, sane men, obedient men, stable in contentment. Crying, my baby, my mother, my only, only love, groaning, my sin, my terrible God, screaming with pain, muttering with fever, bemoaning old age and poverty how can they tend the wheels? And if they cannot tend the wheels, they... Corpses of a thousand 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 men and women would be hard to bury or burn. And after all, Fanny's tone was coaxing, it's not as though there were anything painful or disagreeable about having one or two men besides Henry. And seeing that you ought to be a little more promiscuous stability, insisted the controller, stability. The primal and the ultimate need. Stability. Hence all this. With a wave of his hand he indicated the gardens, the huge building of the conditioning center, the naked children furtive in the undergrowth or running across the lawns. Lenina shook her head. Somehow, she mused, I hadn't been feeling very keen on promiscuity lately. There are times when one doesn't. Haven't you found that too, Fanny? Fanny nodded her sympathy and understanding. But one's got to make the effort, she said, sententiously, one's got to play the game. After all, everyone belongs to everyone else. Yes, everyone belongs to everyone else, repeated slowly and, sighing, was silent for a moment, then, taking Fanny's hand, gave it a little squeeze. You're quite right, Fanny. As usual. I'll make the effort. P.P., Lenina impulse arrested spills over, and the flood is feeling, the flood is passion, the flood is even madness, it depends on the force of the current, the height and strength of the barrier. The unchecked stream flows smoothly down its appointed channels into a calm well-being. The embryo is hungry, day in. Day out, the blood surrogate pump unceasingly turns its 800 revolutions a minute. The decanted infant howls, at once a nurse appears with a bottle of external secretion. Feeling lurks in that interval of time between desire and its consummation. Shorten that interval, break down all those old unnecessary barriers. Fortunate boys, said the controller. No pains have been spared to make your lives emotionally easy to preserve you, so far as that is possible, from having emotions at all. Boards in his flivver, murmured the DHC. All's well with the world. Lenina Crown, said Henry Foster, echoing the assistant predestinator's question as he zipped up his trousers. Oh, she's a splendid girl. Wonderfully pneumatic. I'm surprised you haven't had her. T can't think how it is I haven't, said the assistant predestinator. I certainly will. At the first opportunity. From his place on the opposite side of the change in groom aisle, Bernard Marx overheard what they were saying and turned pale. And to tell the truth, 
said Lenina. I'm beginning to get just a tiny bit bored with nothing but Henry every day. She pulled on her left stocking. Do you know Bernard Marx? She asked in a tone whose excessive casualness was evidently forced. Fanny looked startled. You don't mean to say. Why not? Bernard's an alpha plus. Besides, he asked me to go to one of the savage reservations with him. I've always wanted to see a savage reservation. But his reputation. What do I care about his reputation? They say he doesn't like obstacle golf. They say, they say, mocked Lenina. And then he spends most of his time by himself alone. There was horror in Fanny's voice. Well, he won't be alone when he's with me. And anyhow, why are people so beastly to him? I think he's rather sweet. She smiled to herself, how absurdly shy he had been. Frightened almost as though she were a world controller and he a gamma minus machine minder. Consider your own lives, said Mustafa Mond. Has any of you ever encountered an insurmountable obstacle? The question was answered by a negative silence. Has any of you been compelled to live through a long time interval between the consciousness of a desire and its fulfillment? Well, began one of the boys, and hesitated. Speak up, said the DHC don't keep his fortship waiting. I once had to wait nearly four weeks before a girl I wanted would let me have her. And you felt a strong emotion in consequence. Horrible. Horrible, precisely, said the controller. Our ancestors were so stupid and short-sighted that when the first reformers came along and offered to deliver them from those horrible emotions, they wouldn't have anything to do with them. Talking about her as though she were a bit of meat. Bernard ground his teeth. Have her here, have her there. Like mutton. Degrading her to so much mutton. She said she'd think it over, she said she'd give me an answer this week. Oh, Ford, Ford, Ford. He would have liked to go up to them and hit them in the face hard, again and again. Yes. I really do advise you to try her, Henry Foster was saying. Take ectogenesis. Fitzner and Kawaguchi had got the whole underscore technique worked out. But would the governments look at it? No. There was something called Christianity. Women were forced to go on being viviparous. He's so ugly, said Fanny. But I rather like his looks. And then so small. Fanny made a grimace, smallness was so horribly and typically low caste. T think that's rather sweet, said Lenina. One feels one would like to pet him. You know. Like a cat. Fanny was shocked. They say somebody made a mistake when he was still in the bottle thought he was a gamma and put alcohol into his blood surrogate. That's why he's so stunted. What nonsense Lenina was indignant. Sleep teaching was actually prohibited in England. There was something called liberalism. Parliament, if you know what that was, passed a law against it. The records survive. Speeches about liberty of the subject. Liberty to be inefficient and miserable. Freedom to be a round peg in a square hole. But, my dear chap, you're welcome, I assure you. You're welcome. Henry Foster patted the assistant predestinator on the shoulder. Everyone belongs to everyone else, after all. One hundred repetitions three nights a week for four years, thought Bernard Marx, who was a specialist on hypnopedia. Sixty-two thousand four hundred repetitions make one truth. Idiots. Or the caste system. Constantly proposed, constantly rejected. There was something called democracy. As though men were more than physico-chemically equal. Well, all I can say is that I'm going to accept his invitation. Bernard hated them, hated them. But they were too, they were large, they were strong. Then the Nine Years' War began in AF-141. Not even if it weave true about the alcohol in his blood surrogate. Phosgene, chloropicrin, ethyl iodoacetate, diphenylcyanercine, trichlormethyl, chloroformate, dichlorethyl sulfate. Not to mention hydrocyanic acid. Which I simply don't believe. Lenina concluded. The noise of 14,000 aeroplanes advancing in open order. But in the Kerfirst and Dam and the Eighth. Arrondissement, the explosion of the anthrax bombs is hardly louder than the popping of a paper bag. Because I do want to see a savage reservation. Change C6H, no, G plus HG, CNO, equals well, what? An enormous hole in the ground, a pile of masonry, some bits of flesh and mucus, a foot, with the boot still on it, flying through the air and landing flop, in the middle of the geraniums the scarlet ones, such a splendid show that summer. You're hopeless, Lenina, I give you up. The Russian technique for infecting water supplies was particularly ingenious. Back turned to back, Fanny and Lenina continued their changing in silence. The Nine Years' War, the Great Economic Collapse. There was a choice between world control and destruction. Between stability A and D. Fanny crowns a nice girl too, said the assistant predestinator. In the nurseries, the elementary class consciousness lesson was over, the voices were adapting future demand to future industrial supply. I do love flying, they whispered, I do love flying, I do love having new clothes, 
I do love. Liberalism, of course, was dead of anthrax, but all the same you couldn't do things by force. Not nearly so pneumatic as Lenina. Oh, not nearly. But old clothes are beastly, continued the untiring whisper. We always throw away old clothes. Ending is better than mending, ending is better than mending, ending is better governments an affair of sitting, not hitting. You rule with the brains and the buttocks, never with the fists. For example, there was the conscription of consumption. There, I'm ready, said Lenina, but Fanny remained speechless and averted. Let's make peace, Fanny darling. Every man, woman, and child compelled to consume so much a year. In the interests of industry. The sole result. Ending is better than mending. The more stitches, the less riches, the more stitches. One of these days, said Fanny, with dismal emphasis, you'll get into trouble. Conscientious objection on an enormous scale, anything not to consume. Back to nature. I do love flying. I do love flying. Back to culture. Yes, actually to culture. You can't consume much if you sit still and read books. Do I look all right? Lenina asked. Her jacket was made of bottle green acetate cloth with green viscose fur at the cuffs and collar. 800 simple lifers were mowed down by machine guns at Golders Green. Ending is better than mending, ending is better than mending. Green corduroy shorts and white viscose woolen stockings turned down below the knee. Then came the famous British Museum massacre. 2,000 culture fans guessed with dichlorethyl sulfid. A green and white jockey cap shaded Lenina's eyes, her shoes were bright green and highly polished. In the end, said Mustafa Mond, the controllers realized that force was no good. The slower but infinitely surer methods of ectogenesis, neo-Pavlovian conditioning, and hypnopedia. And round her waist she wore a silver-mounted green Morocco surrogate cartridge belt, bulging, for Lenina was not a free Martin, with the regulation supply of contraceptives.